there are four primary components to compensation. Step number one is you should negotiate, especially with these big tech companies. Now the question is, how did I negotiate? The big thing here is you need to have leverage. The way you have leverage is by- I'm gonna tell the recruiter, and I have this done this once, let's not give a higher offer. I'm not that excited about this candidate. Hey, this is Gary with The Pragmatic Engineer. Negotiating your offer is one of the highest leverage things that you can do for your career. I've been a hiring manager at Uber. I've extended dozens of offers. And for this video, I've invited Rahul Pandey, staff engineer at Facebook, who also runs a popular YouTube channel. Subscribe for his channel below. Now Rahul graduated from Stanford. He worked at a startup that got acquired by Pinterest a year later. And after a few years at Pinterest, he interviewed and got a bunch of offers at hand, which he then negotiated. We're both gonna share our insights, Rahul, his advice on what worked for him. And from the hiring manager side, I'll share what I've seen work for candidates. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel if you'd like to see similar content on software engineering and engineering management. All right, Rahul, great having you on this channel. Today, we're gonna be talking about negotiating compensation as a software engineer in the US and I'll chime in some things about Europe. So before we start, I just wanna do some rapid fire questions. When was the last time you were on call and how many times did you get paid? Yeah, I work on a calling product at Facebook. We have a lot of incidents or anomalies whenever there's a holiday. The last time I was on call, I believe it happened during Easter time. And so I did get paid more than usual, five or six times. And just to answer the question, staff engineers do go on call at Facebook, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most teams, regardless of your engineering level, there is an expectation that you're gonna be on call. So no one's like above that. Awesome. What was the most number of parallel job offers and like one job search that you had on hand? Right before joining Facebook in 2017, I had six offers. And you know, actually throughout my time at Stanford and then even after graduating from Stanford, Back in the day, I had another lengthy interview session. I had five offers at that time. The maximum number was six. We're gonna have to dive into that for yeah. sure. Last rapid fire question. What is a piece of advice that changed your life? The piece of advice that I really try and follow every single day is be input driven, not output driven. Rather than being disappointed by the outcome of, okay, I didn't lose weight or I didn't have this big product, which is used by millions of people, be much more input driven. And input driven means I put in half an hour a day building out this program, I spent half an hour a day going to the gym. I can control that, right? I can't control the outcome. If you have this mindset of, I can control the system, the inputs that go into it, but I can't really control the output, I think you're gonna be much happier. And actually in the long run, you're gonna be much more productive. Let's jump into compensation. You have had six offers on hand at some point in Silicon Valley. Can you talk me through on what compensation means? Because what I found, especially coming from Europe, the compensation for most people means salary. Yep. The way I think about it, there are four primary components to compensation. And base salary, the annual salary that you get, is just one of them, right? The other three are an annual bonus, which many companies might have, a sign-on bonus, which especially larger companies are gonna typically have some sort of sign-on, and then also equity, which is like a big variable factor. At a startup, you might get options, and then at larger companies, you're gonna get RSUs, or restricted stock units, which are basically like a, a free stock in the company, depending on how long you've been there. And also there's arguably a fifth component as well, which is like perks. Like a lot of the companies in Silicon Valley will have free food, right? Or like laundry or whatever else you might think of. I didn't consider that too deeply in my process just because I, at least the companies I interviewed at were all fairly similar. Like there wasn't too much variability in that category, mm -hmm. but there certainly is a lot of variability on the other four categories, depending on the stage of the company. One of the things I really learned throughout my experience is that it's important to know where is the company willing to move, right? Because like if you phrase the conversation with a recruiter as, hey, what are the different levers in the compensation package? That's where you can start to have a more nuanced discussion about like what is important to you and what is important for the company. So for example, many of these big companies may have fairly well-defined bands about base salary. So like you're coming at a certain level, you really don't have that much wiggle room up or down because you're pegged to that level. But equity might actually be something where they could go much higher if you care about that, if you have some sort of leverage or if you really express to the company that this is something that will make or break the deal for you. So depending on kind of what you're interested in and also what the company is able to move on, that can lead to a lot of negotiation. Well, I'm very familiar because Uber does have these same things, except in Europe, we did sign on bonuses a lot less mm. in Amsterdam and Uber in Amsterdam. We did do it for people who asked for it. Most people didn't know or didn't have competing offers, whatnot. But in Europe, before I joined Uber, my view was typically, well, there's base salary and you might get a bonus, maybe 10%. That's really good. Mm. And this was kind of it. I started to appreciate equity when I started to read about the equity that's in the US, but I, I never thought that this would come to Europe. It is now coming actually, like not the same 
amount as you would get in Silicon Valley, but a large amount compared to traditional Europe. And the interesting thing is a lot of European engineers absolutely discount equity. So mm -hmm. the US based recruiter who came to Amsterdam to hire engineers and Uber did like pretty decent equity packages told me that people just didn't care. They're like, well, we're yeah. giving you RSUs. And they're like, can you just give me five grand more in base salary? Right. Especially when it's options, people get really scared. And I think there's two reasons for it. For one, people just don't know. And second, there, there have been not many exits in Europe. The biggest exits are actually US companies hiring in, in Europe. How important is equity in places that you work? Equity is probably the most undervalued aspect of these negotiations because I think it's what you said, right? There's a lack of awareness about like how does this actually work? Especially options, you start getting into a more complicated territory because you have to pay some amount of money in order to be able to exercise that option, right? With RSUs, it's a bit more straightforward, but still, I think people just don't know about this form of compensation. And I think that's the biggest mistake I see people make, especially in more senior roles in Silicon Valley. What you'll find is the majority of compensation will actually come from equity, from stock, rather than from base salary. So that, that should give you kind of a good perspective that there's so much more variability and so much more opportunity for your equity to actually grow, right? If you, especially if you believe in the company, that can really be a huge way to increase your total compensation if you understand how it works. I'd love to hear how you went about negotiation. What kind of ideas helped you? How did you find that information? Ultimately, how did you negotiate that six offers? How did you even get six offers? Like that's insane. Let me start by saying, first off, that you should negotiate. You know, there's an article by Patrick McKenzie, who's at Stripe now, and he's pretty well known in the blogging world. But he wrote a really long and detailed article about negotiation. The way he described it is put yourself in an uncomfortable situation for half an hour, and you might actually end up getting $50,000 or $100,000 more. It's obvious that anyone would want to do that, right? Like just half an hour of discomfort, but it's not public. No one's like judging you, right? And you actually have a pretty high chance of meaningfully improving your quality of life. So why wouldn't you? Step number one is you should negotiate, especially with these big tech companies. Now the question is, how did I negotiate? The big thing here is you need to have leverage. The way you have leverage is by having competing offers. The way you have competing offers is you need to make sure that they line up at the same time. So you need to plan out your interviews such that they actually happen at roughly the same time so you can get offers at the same time, right? One of the things that I feel like people often mistake is that they don't know how to maneuver the interviews such that they happen at the same time. The big thing here is just be transparent. So when I was going through the process before joining Facebook, I literally told every recruiter that, hey, I'm talking to you and I'm excited by the work that you're doing, but I'm also talking to these other three or four or five companies and I'm going to spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week with you. That's a big decision in my life. And I want to make sure I feel good about that decision. And so therefore, I really want to collect all the data and I won't be able to commit to you until I actually finish the process with these other companies. And so I feel like having that really transparent conversation with the recruiter and telling them that this is important to you, collecting the data and making a good decision is good for you and good for them. I feel like almost every recruiter kind of understood that. They were receptive to me telling them to wait or accelerate the process based on the timeline. How many places did you apply to to get those six offers in the end? Because you yeah. probably didn't get an offer from every single place. Right, yeah. I, I'm happy to be transparent about that. I think I applied to nine companies total. And then after one round of interviews, I kind of turned down one company because it was like geographically, it was like too far away. I didn't want to commute that far. This is pre-COVID. There were two companies I didn't get an offer at. And then the other six I did get an offer at. You've got a really good track record. I also have a pretty decent track record back in Europe. I'll talk about it in a separate video. But just to give a bit of reality check, because I think a lot of people will be like, that's insane. I have recently mentored an engineering manager who actually in the end got offers from the likes of like Discord, Rivian, Google, a couple of other companies. He got like five offers, but he started with 40 places oh, and wow. he did full time. He left his job and for two months he interviewed full time and he showed me the list of all the rejections. He started to get more offers once he got his first few offers. I'm going to share a little bit on what's happening on the hiring manager side because I was doing this for years at Uber. What you said about negotiation is absolutely true. So when you negotiate, you typically negotiate with the recruiter. As a hiring manager, we don't care too much. So recruiters are used to negotiating. They know what they can and cannot budge on. I had a video on what actually happens behind the scenes when you get an offer. Recruiters typically at these large companies work with central compensation teams to give them numbers based on the input they have. And if they tell them this candidate has outstanding offers or is looking to get offers there, the central comp team might give them higher offers. And for large tech companies, you're right, base salary is typically pretty fixed. Bonuses, what you're eligible for is, are also fixed. 
the sign on and the stock is where there is room for negotiation. As, as you said, you need to have leverage. Now, the interesting thing is that it's always better to negotiate with the recruiter about compensation because they're used to it. Yeah. If you get a hiring manager on the call and you start negotiating with them, we're not used to negotiating yeah. that much. Mm -hmm. In general, you have nothing to lose. I have not seen an offer resigned it at my four years at Uber. So we never said like, oh, you're asking for more, we're gonna take it back. There was one point where I got like slightly upset where there was this person who like kept toying with us, kept asking for more. We gave him a bit more, asking for a bit more, but it wasn't really transparent. In the end, we just put a saying like, you have a week to decide. Definitely, I think with this kind of negotiation, the stakes are high, right? Like at least for you. So I think the ground rule here is always do it respectfully. Make sure you communicate with the hiring manager, the recruiter. Even if you end up not joining the company, if you have five offers, you're not gonna join five companies, right? So you wanna make sure that with the other four companies, you leave it in a way that they respect you and you respect them. Then the other thing I wanted to mention was that you talked about how like you've never heard of an offer rescinded. I think that's 100% true because it would almost be irrational for the company to rescind an offer. At these big tech companies, you have like a phone screen, maybe two phone screens, then you have an on-site interview where you have like you know, six, seven hours of meetings with yeah. different people. At that point, they've invested literally thousands of dollars of time into getting to know you. And you are one of the, I don't know, five or 10% of people who have actually made it through and have received an offer. So for a company like Pinterest or Uber or Facebook to actually say, hey, you know, you're causing too much hassle for us. We don't want you anymore because you're asking for a little bit more equity. It just would be totally irrational, right? As long as you're doing it respectfully. So I feel like that's like one other thing to kind of keep in mind as you go through the process. That is so important because I will tell you as a hiring manager, so hiring managers do have a say. So ultimately the recruiter is working for me. I'm gonna put it very bluntly. I have the head count, I need to fill it and I have a recruiter assigned to me who's gonna help me fill it. And that is the recruiter's goal, by the way. And that's why the recruiter is on the candidate side. They will actually advocate and they'll take care of the negotiation and they'll push as much as they can. But if we're on a call and I feel that this person is not really positive about the company and they're just in it for the money, I'm gonna tell the recruiter, and I have this done this once, let's not give a higher offer. I'm not mm -hmm. that excited about this candidate. If only they would have been a bit more positive on like, hey, that they're excited about the team, whatnot, and that was missing. And again, offer was not resigned. We just, we didn't increase. I actually said like, well, they told us this other company has a higher offer if they're going for the money yeah let's not increase let's see what they choose i'm not saying to be super positive when you're not because if you're not excited with the company it is money as well but it's not just money would yeah. you really want to work at a place where the hiring manager and the team who interviewed you don't feel a connection in fact you disliked a few people and my answer should be run <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's, it's it's not it's life is too short yeah and if, if you're spending you know a full 40 50 hours a week with people who you don't respect or they don't respect you that's definitely not a place that you wanna be no matter how much you're getting paid. So I think there's definitely a kind of a, a tactful and correct way to go about this. One tactical thing I can share here is that throughout the process, I would often get on the phone with the recruiter and I think oftentimes, or, or the hiring manager, and oftentimes they would want to kind of gauge how I'm feeling. It's okay, here are the new numbers, like, tell me what you think. And almost always the correct answer there is interesting. Okay, like, let me think about that. That's, that's very interesting. Um, and the reason I, I, I say that is because there's a huge information asymmetry, right? The recruiter has hundreds or maybe thousands of data points about what is a competitive offer for your level, whereas you maybe have one or two, or maybe you could look on Glassdoor to get a sense of it, but it's, it's hard to really get a Don't really look on Glassdoor. <laughs> um, Glassdoor is outdated, but yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's actually very hard to get a concrete sense other than the actual numbers you have, right? And so... Yep, and 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 but and the numbers are, are updated. So like I will say within the company, the numbers are updated every now and then. Uh, as a hiring manager, I learn about the new numbers as, as they came in. Uh, because Uber and other companies, they buy the market data, they ask what the candidates are. And you're right, it's information asymmetry. My negotiation tactic at Uber was also, I got a really good offer and I said, it's interesting, let me think about it and let right. me get back to you. Let me talk it through with my family, whatnot. Yeah. And then you go offline. The other advice is if you know people who have gone this, ask them, they'll be better sources of advice than the internet. Yeah, you know, these YouTube videos like that we're doing, they're good, but having someone who's local, I think your advice absolutely stands for Silicon Valley. It will stand for some other metropolitan areas. It might not stand for certain other regions fully. Yeah, saying interesting, saying something non-committal on the phone, and then also introducing artificial delay. Like I think what you said is like, let me talk to my family. That's great. Like I, I would say like, let me talk to my, my wife. Let me talk to my my parents and get their advice. So like that way, these phone conversations are often high pressure and you want to actually take those and make them asynchronous. I always did all of my like, here's what I would like. I did that over email because I can then control the tone. I can control exactly what I'm saying. And there's no kind of 
pressure to like immediately commit to something, right? So that was and, one and thing. That by I the way, really I, you're you're fully right. Uh, when I was on these calls, because I, I did usually recruiters do these calls. That's interesting. Hiring manager not there, but I often shadowed them, and I sometimes mm. did some of the calls. I insisted on presenting numbers, and we do want people to close. We do want to have a healthy pressure. So typically, you do the number, and you say we ask them what I I used to do. How do you feel about it? Yeah. And what would it take for you to do a commitment? And we want to push them because ultimately we cannot keep the position open forever. I want to get a sense of how excited this person is. It's not about bullying them. I do want to get a sense. And if I feel that they're a bit uncertain, I want to address it. I know that if they commit, they will mean it. There's nothing wrong with what you're saying. Asking for time, that's the best thing you can do. Like I'm kind of speaking against the hiring managers right now, but it's, it's true because you want to be happy with your decision. I think the worst thing that you can do, you sign and you say like, oh damn, yeah. uh, I have second thoughts and I got a better offer, I'm going to break the contract. No one's happy with that. Yeah, yeah. no one wants buyer's remorse. Like the worst thing that can happen is you sign on the contract and then a week later you say, actually, I don't want this anymore. You'll lose all respect on both sides. I always tried to push away from committing anything verbally. I always want to do that in writing over email where I had time to process and think. The last thing I'll mention here is that it's not a zero sum game in the sense that like me as a candidate, if you say I want, you know, 10% more equity, it's not like that equity is coming out of your pocket or the recruiter's pocket, right? At these large companies, like the ones that I interviewed at, which were, you know, Silicon Valley based, and I'm sure, you know, at Uber in Europe, it's similar. It's like they have a very large pool of equity or compensation that they can dole out. And it's not like it's hurting anyone, right? So like you shouldn't have this fear that I'm going to be judged or I'm going to be hurting someone else by asking for more. These big companies have pretty deep pockets and they, they're happy to pay an extra 10 or 20%. It, it makes no difference to their bottom line for one candidate to get an extra 20 or 30% compensation. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a secret. If you're at a startup that just raised $2 million and that's their whole funding and you know, you're know you asking for an extra 20K more, as a CEO, they will be thinking you know, you're, you're shrinking the pie. Yeah. At Uber, we did not have budgets. We had head counts. Right. Exactly. It, it, it did not come out of budget. If this person got an extra, you know, like 100K or 50K in equity, you're right. It didn't matter. So I, I'm just like plus wanting everything that you said, which I think is pretty cool because we're we're saying it from the both sides. Well, th thank you so much, Rahul, for coming onto this channel. Head over to Rahul's channel to watch the other part of our conversation, which is about getting promoted at large tech companies and also your story of how you got to the staff level. So see you there. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time. And I think that this has been a really informative conversation for me as well.